Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. If I told you that there was a disease that was deadlier than HIV AIDS and we weren't doing enough about it, we would want to do something. If I told you that there was a global pandemic and we really hadn't heard about it, this room would be full, it would be packed, there would be lines out the door. If I told you that 350,000 people are dying every year from this disease, which is one of just many subtypes of this disease affecting this organ, we would all be in a panic. And yet that is in fact the case with hepatitis C. That is the case adding zeros, adding uh, logarithmic algorithms for viral hepatitis and types of liver disease that are affecting communities around the world. We've seen an increase of 40% of new cases just since 2010. This is something that is rising, it is growing, it is expanding, it is uh, spreading to every community. And yet, 80% or more people don't even know that they have it already. It is at such a level that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the USPSTF has said that every baby boomer should be screened for hepatitis C. Every baby boomer, no matter what color, what class, what circumstance, everyone potentially is affected. Frankly, the risk profile uh, is, is now understood for liver diseases that if you have a liver, you may at some point get a liver disease. And so we should start paying attention. We have two dynamic speakers here today to help us understand and wrap our minds around and start to grapple with this crisis. We have Dr. Charles Howard, uh, who after an illustrious career at the University of Maryland, we are very proud to have him here in Washington, D.C. He was recently appointed as chair of internal medicine at Howard University. And as chair, Dr. Howell is responsible for overseeing all academic, clinical, and research activities of the department, as well as directing a new interdisciplinary viral hepatitis program that will work to reduce the burden of hepatitis in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. He's certainly a no stranger to those of you who have attended the National Minority Quality uh, Forum meetings before, but there is a new urgency um, to this position. There's a new urgency to the work, the great work that Dr. Howell has been doing. And so he will give you a sense of the latest science and the truly transformative treatments that are now available for liver patients with hepatitis C. And I don't use that word lightly. These are transformative um, paradigms for cures. Yes, I use the word. We don't get to use it in many other fields. But they are curing patients with hepatitis C. And so Dr. Howell will give you an insight into what this landscape is uh, changing, is innovating, is transforming into. And then our second speaker is Teresa Howell Hughes. Teresa Hughes is a CEO and founder of a truly revolutionary organization called Wings of Life um, and Hughes Healthcare Disparities Group. She is a healthcare economist, someone we don't often have at the table when we talk about uh, patient advocacy or research or changing the dynamics of a field, but it is exactly who we need it. Teresa is an economist and a community activist uh, who is dedicated to sustain, uh, creating sustainable, sustainable public and political awareness programs that will reduce disparities of viral hepatitis, both HBV and HCV, which is an epidemic in underserved communities. Ms. Hughes is the architect of the nationally recognized Central Valley Break the Silence on HCV Summit, which I had the honor of participating into. And so today we will understand not only the science, the treatments, but also how we can link patients to care and what we need from you, from everyone in this room and everyone that you will tell after you leave the session is the strength of advocacy that we need to ensure access for all patients, no matter their color, circumstances, or status. So Dr. Howell. Well, good morning. Uh, Donna, thank you for that introduction. Uh, Dr. Christensen, other members of the uh, uh, Congress and uh, 
other elected officials, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a privilege and an honor to be invited to uh, participate in this program. Let me see here. Now, uh, before I get started, I'd, I'd like to uh, preface my remarks by saying that uh, our session, the time for our session has been uh, reduced for, to, to uh, 30 minutes total, and therefore uh, my presentation will likewise be contracted somewhat from what I had uh, planned. Oh, it's already here. Let's see. Okay, so uh, this morning I uh, will address you on the challenges and opportunities uh, in the area of chronic hepatitis C in African Americans. My disclosures are there. So this uh, shows the general outline for my, uh, for my presentation. The challenges uh, confronting us regarding hepatitis C, particularly in the African American and other uh, underserved communities are listed here. They're reflected in the trends in the epidemiology, uh, what we know about the disease course and clinical outcomes. And it relates to African Americans in particular, at least historically, the lower efficacy of treatment for hepatitis C. And then lastly, barriers to healthcare access and quality, many of which have been well documented. However, we have, uh, there have been many uh, advances in, in the area. And now we enter into a phase of new opportunities. Uh, there are new screening uh, recommendations uh, that have emanated from the CDC. The Affordable Care Act of 2010 uh, would uh, go a long way toward overcoming one of the major issues in terms of uh, quality uh, uh, health care, that is access. And then uh, we have uh, now uh, in the forefront uh, more newer, uh, more effective and safer treatments for hepatitis C, and particularly treatments that do not involve or include interferon and ribavirin, which are the main reasons or the main causes for the lower tolerance of therapy uh, in uh, previous, uh, previously. So um, uh, many of you may be familiar with some of the information on this slide. As uh, uh, Ms. Cryer indicated, there are approximately 150 million persons in the world who are infected with chronic with the hepatitis C virus. And again, about, it's been estimated that up to 350,000 persons die from the complications of this disease on an annual basis, it's worldwide. But in the United States, it's been estimated that somewhere between three and four million persons have, are infected uh, with the hepatitis C virus. And as a result, it's the most common bloodborne infection, blood uh, infection uh, in the country. Uh, it's the main cause for cirrhosis and primary liver cancer, and is the main indication for liver transplantation in, the, in this country, accounting for over 40% of the liver transplant procedures. As uh, indicated, and as uh, Ms. Cryer referred to, indicated uh, the mortality rate for hepatitis C has been increasing over the last uh, decade or two, and it comes with a considerable cost in terms of healthcare dollars and healthcare utilization. It's also been recognized for a while now that the prevalence of hepatitis C is much greater in African Americans and that the disease has a worse outcome uh, in, uh, in uh, African Americans. Some of the data is, is shown, is summarized on this slide. Uh, most of the data emanates from the uh, CDC in Haines study, but uh, between two, 1999 and 2002, uh, the prevalence of hepatitis C was in African Americans was twice that in whites. Um, 3% versus 1.5%. And when the uh, cases are uh, disaggregated and expressed based on race and ethnicity, what you find is that about 2.6 million cases were uh, estimated to occur in whites, 900,000 in African Americans, and about 260,000 in Mexican Americans. Now during this uh, time period, African Americans accounted for 12 to 13% of the U.S. population but 22%, a whopping 22% of the uh, HCV cases in the United States. And if you further uh, dissect the prevalence based on, on age, you'll find that 9% of African Americans from the ages of 40 to 49 years are old or are estimated to be infected with hepatitis C, at least were estimated to be infected during that time period compared to 3.8% of, of 3.5% of Caucasians. And when you take into consideration that the NHANES study uh, did not uh, sample incarcerated 
or homeless persons, and some other data, some, uh, and the, um, the recognition that these estimates are imprecise, it's estimated that somewhere between 1.5 and 2 million African Americans may be infected with a hepatitis C uh, virus. Now, this slide illustrates the natural history of hepatitis C. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, uh, but the important point to note is that the majority of people who are exposed to hepatitis C actually develop chronic or persistent infection. And this is much greater than uh, the uh, rates that you would see in patients exposed to hepatitis B, where the rate is about 5%, at least in adults, and for hepatitis E, for which there is no persistent or chronic phase. The natural course of the disease is, is, is indolent, but uh, over the, uh, during the first two decades of infection, approximately 20% of persons uh, develop cirrhosis or progress to cirrhosis, and once cirrhosis develops, there is a progressive increase in uh, the uh, incidence of end-stage liver disease and primary liver cancer, or HCC, as uh, abbreviated in this slide. And at this, at this point, where the disease has its greatest uh, negative impact in, um, in, in, in that once a person reaches the end stage of, hep of liver disease, uh, survival depends on, uh, on being able to receive a transplant procedure, which is very costly, uh, uh, very costly, uh, the other point to note is that, uh, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to just speak fr from this slide without going through the details of it, is that the incidence of primary hepatocellular carcinoma, or liver cancer, has doubled over the last uh, two decades or so. And we know from, um, from many uh, sources that the incidence of primary liver cancer is much higher in, um, in minority groups, ethnic and racial minority groups, than in whites. And in general, it's in, in, over the last two decades or so, the, the incidence has been twice, uh, two times that one ob observes in, in, in whites. It's important to note that at least among, um, in, in a general sense, more than 50% of the cases of primary liver cancer in the U.S. are associated with uh, or due to chronic hepatitis C. Uh, and the, the, the other point that was alluded to in terms of the uh, consequences of hepatitis C were by, doc, by Ms. Cryer was the whole issue of mortality. And so as uh, we also, uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, have seen a gradual increase in the mortality rate for hepatitis C. You may not be able to read, see that line very well. It's the middle line. While the uh, mortality rates for HIV have slowly declined. And in 2007, for the first time, the number of persons who uh, died from hepatitis C-related liver disease uh, were exceeded the number of persons dying from consequences of HIV infection. And these, uh, this trend has continued. And if you look at the predictors of death in this particular study, you'll see that, uh, that uh, non-Hispanic blacks and Hispanics and Hispanic uh, ethnicity were associated with a two to threefold higher odd, odds of dying from hepatitis C-related disease compared to whites. So this is uh, basically the challenge. Um, it's been projected that um, the number of persons with end-stage liver disease and primary liver cancer will double during the next uh, two decades or so. And this is, uh, will be associated with a marked increase in mortality rates with some estimates of 30,000 uh, deaths per year related to hepatitis C. And given the disproportionate burden among African Americans, one could predict that African Americans will, will continue to experience a disproportionate share and a disproportionate burden of the morbidity and mortality uh, from hepatitis C. Um, this is basically a, um, a microcosm or at least a, a, um, just one aspect of the national uh, 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 challenge uh, that hepatitis C poses for the public health uh, community. But now we, we do also have some new opportunities, and those, the main opportunities, I think, are, are listed here. Um, uh, the first is, is uh, the development of new uh, treatment regimens, antiviral treatments for hepatitis C. I alluded in the initial slide to new screening guidelines. And then also, uh, lastly, 
um, we have opportunities that are related to uh, the Affordable Care Act, which would bring greater access to care for uh, underserved uh, populations. So the important point to, to, to make about hepatitis C is that in terms of treatment, is that we can cure hepatitis, this infection. Um, and this has been demonstrated, um, and it has been known for many years. However, um, um, for the most part, until recently, treatments were very, were not highly effective and associated with uh, uh, generally uh, uh, intolerable side effects for many. And many patients were not uh, candidates for treatment. But anyway, uh, Following treatment with hepatitis, uh, with, with treatment for hepatitis C, a, an undetectable virus level for at least six months after treatment is uh, completed is basically tantamount to a cure and is associated with significant uh, amelioration in many of the, uh, the diseases and complications that are associated with, uh, with this infection, including um, reduced risk of liver decompensation, liver cancer, the need for liver transplantation, as well as mortality rates. Uh, this slide illustrates the advances in treatment that have, uh, have occurred uh, since the interferon was approved for treatment of hepatitis C in, the, in 1991. The important point to note is that there has been a gradual in increase. I'm not sure if I have a pointer there. Anyway, um, the uh, fourth bar to your right uh, would, would, would uh, indicate the uh, efficacy of treatments, the most, some of the most, the new, um, the most, more recent advances in treatment, that is with the development of so-called uh, direct acting antiviral treatments, uh, the first of which were a couple of hepatitis C protease inhibitors. But uh, what you will note is that uh, um, up until that, and through that time period, the efficacy of treatment in blacks shown by the black bar uh, was significantly lower than what had been observed or could be achieved in whites. I'm not going to speak in, a lot, in detail about uh, new treatment developments, but uh, only Horizon or um, a number of regimens of so-called all oral direct acting antiviral treatments. The paradigm is similar to that that's uh, uh, currently utilized for treatment of HIV. Uh, but as you can see, as we proceed up that, up to, from left to right, that the differences in efficacy in treatment between African Americans and whites has uh, actually uh, gradually and slowly declined to the point where the results of some uh, recent clinical trials are showing no differences in the outcomes of treatment. So this is a significant, uh, significant uh, advance. Some of the, the uh, the uh, proof or evidence that curing hepatitis C has a beneficial effect on hard clinical outcomes such as uh, liver-related mortality, liver cancer, and deaths and, and, and transplantation are shown on this slide. But um, suffice it to say that uh, this is just one of many studies that have document, documented the benefits of, of, of what we call the sustained virologic response, but it's a cure of chronic hepatitis C infection. So the challenge at this point is to identify patients who have hepatitis C and link them to care and treatment. Um, but the problem that we face is that, as, as uh, Ms. Cryer indicated, is that the majority of patients, uh, who, persons who are infected with hepatitis C are unaware that they are infected. So um, somewhere between 50 to 75% of persons are not, in, are not aware that they are infected. In 1998, uh, the CDC issued guidelines uh, and recommendations for screening uh, uh, for hepatitis C, which was uh, focused on persons who were at risk for infection based on uh, very uh, well-documented uh, epidemiological studies. But suffice it to say that uh, over the next um, subsequent 10 to 15 years or so, that we really didn't see much of an impact on, of, of uh, risk-based screening on, the, um, on uh, the number of persons in care, the number of people who were treated for, hep for their hepatitis C infection, uh, which uh, remained uh, less than 10% of the population. So um, 
recently, uh, in 2012, the CDC uh, released uh, new guidelines which uh, uh, recommended uh, screening of persons born between 1945 and 1965, the so-called baby boom generation. And the main reason for that, uh, the, the uh, underlying uh, basis for that recommendation was the observation that three-fourths of persons with chronic hepatitis C in the United States were born during this time period and contracted hepatitis C for the most part during the 1970s and 1980s. And this is the population that uh, is uh, certainly at increased risk for complications of, uh, of hepatitis C, including mortality. So uh, in starting in 2012, um, the recommendation is that the persons born during, the, again, a period from 1945 to 1965 have a one-time uh, test for hepatitis C without any effort to ascertain whether or not they have uh, fit into any of the risk groups. And as of this year, this includes persons between 49 and 69 years of age. Um, the recommendations continue to uh, call for screening in persons with uh, well-documented risk factors for hepatitis C, um, as shown on this slide. Also, uh, because of the uh, negative impact of alcohol uh, on the uh, outcomes of hepatitis C, that is, alcohol uh, use, certainly alcohol abuse being associated with higher, with the more uh, faster progression to, to end-stage liver disease and death, uh, it's recommended that all persons who are identified or found to be positive for hepatitis C undergo screening for uh, alcohol uh, use and be referred to care if necessary. Now, uh, the important, uh, that the previous slide uh, indicated that the U.S. Preventive Task Force, Pre Preventive Services Task Force has endorsed the uh, screening recommendation for both birth cohort as well as risk-based screening with the grade of A or B. And that's significant because not only is the Affordable Care Act going to provide increased access to care, it requires that private health plans provide uh, preventive services, including hepatitis C screening, um, uh, for uh, recommendations that receive an A or B grade without cost, without coinsurance or, a de or deductible. Uh, there are other, many other salutary effects of the Affordable Care Act as it relates to hepatitis C and other conditions, um, and those are listed on this slide, including uh, incentives for Medicaid programs to cover services and um, a pr prohibition of, of in, for, uh, against insurance companies declining persons because of pre-existing conditions. Also, the Affordable Care Act um, will involve new uh, increased uh, investment in community health programs where many of these patients will uh, be able to receive care. But, once, but uh, uh, despite these uh, uh, salutary advances, we still uh, continue and will continue to have to confront many of the uh, disparities uh, that have been identified in, in care uh, and quality care for patients with hepatitis C. You probably can't re read this, but data from the Veterans Administration uh, where uh, access to care is really not the problem have shown that African Americans and Hispanics were less likely to be considered treatment candidates by the clinicians. Um, and they, as a result, or likewise, these populations continue to re re receive fewer interferon prescriptions. Um, and there's some, and it goes on and on, but, um, but nonetheless, these uh, barriers will not disappear simply by the uh, enactment or the, of the Affor Affordable Care uh, Act, and therefore would uh, continue to need uh, our uh, attention and diligence. Primary hepatocellular carcinoma, we referred, I indicated that the mortality rate, the incidence and the mortality rate <clears throat> was significantly higher in African Americans and other ethnic minorities. Um, for some reasons, um, African Americans, for reasons that are not completely clear, tend to have more advanced uh, primary liver cancers at diagnosis. And um, um, somewhat disappointingly is that uh, studies have shown that African Americans are less likely to receive local or surgical resection therapy, surgical therapy than Caucasians, even with the tumor localized to the liver. So 
Um, another e example of uh, disparities that, uh, uh, that are uh, seeking a solution. There are other areas in, li in the area of liver transplantation as well, which uh, for sake of time would not, uh, would not cover. <clears throat> in response to the uh, crisis of hepatitis C in the African American community, <clears throat> I wanted to alert you that the National Medical Association recently uh, released a consensus paper uh, on hepatitis C entitled Hepatitis C, A Crisis in the African American Community. And this is available online uh, at the uh, website that was, uh, listed, that's listed below for free. Uh, there are a number of recommendations which you can review um, uh, on, on your own and we might discuss in the question and answer period. And likewise, uh, later today, Dr. Howard Cole from the uh, uh, Department of Health and Human Services will be here as a keynote speaker, but I <coughs> want to uh, inform you that uh, in 2010, the HHS initi uh, initiated or released the, uh, viral hep the first viral hepatitis C action plan, and that uh, this year they have it's been reauthorized to continue for another three years. Uh, this is also available free of charge at the uh, uh, HHS website. And I would uh, encourage you to become, all to become, or to familiarize yourself with the uh, tenets of these, uh, both the NMA and the uh, Viral Hepatitis Action Plan. It's important to note that one of the prior priority areas in the HHS plan, one of the seven or so, is educating providers and communities to reduce health disparities. But I should uh, state that um, the um, HHS uh, CDC, they can't do this alone. Um, they rec need um, continued, they need, uh, you know, proactive involvement um, from all of the stakeholders uh, in this area. Uh, we need to ensure that th these efforts receive adequate funding, but we also have to monitor, we have to be a part of the, the process of the solution, but we have to monitor these efforts to be sure that they're having the, the desired impact in African American Hispanic, and other people of color. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you so much, Dr. Howell. Teresa, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you. Hi, um, as Donna politely introduced me, my name is Teresa Hughes Sakai. I finally used my married last name. Um, and I'm an economist, and so it's often very strange for me to be in front of a group of people who are all doctors, um, all of the medical field, and then I come out and say, I'm an economist. Basically, what I do is I understand numbers. My specialty is looking at the underbelly of what those numbers really mean. So as we've talked so much today, and you'll talk so much over the next couple of days around the form of healthcare disparities, what we've developed is a program to really understand what those numbers mean. How do they impact communities of color? How do they impact making change? How do you form organizations so that when you walk into the room, you have a set of numbers that says, this is how it really means. So when Dr. Howell spoke of a few minutes ago about the premature death as a result of hep C, so you think about it from a terms from that standpoint. That means if someone, hep C is not a disease that you get and you're just dead. You don't just die of hep C. It's a long protracted death. So if you're dying at 45 or 55, so that means somewhere around age 40, you stop being productive. Age 50, you're in really bad shape. 55, you're dead. So somewhere along in that time, you're in your primary economic years, you're in your primary parenting years, you have lost that revenue in that community. So if your age of living is 75, you've lost 20 years plus the additional years that you were disabled. So that to me is when you're talking about healthcare disparities, that's how it rents out. So I'm also not very good at clicking and talking at the same time. Years ago, I was a semi-belly dancer. I could either shake and move, or I could click at the same time. I could never put the two together. This is one black chick that has no friggin' rhythm, so let's start there. So anyway, um, here we go. 
I'm not kidding. I, my grandmother, I stopped tap dancing when I was like four or five years old. I was like a tap dancing fool, but had no rhythm. And this woman came to my grandmother and said, you're wasting your time and your money on her. <laughs> so things ain't changed. So, so what we're talking about today is I'm talking about correctional health care. And the impact of correctional health care is not about what people are in prison. 90% or 85 to 90% of all inmates come out. And they go back to, I was just reminded, not to necessarily use the word communities of commitment or to define that. Community of commitment is those communities which large populations of ex offenders return to. So that's why I'm saying it's not stiff behind the walls. So, so here we are. So when you look at correctional health care, remember that there's this new book out by Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow? And that is a book about mass incarceration. Think about health care, if it, correctional health care is the new Jim Crow of health care. That is another way of looking at it. 7.3 million adults in this country at any given time in this country have received some form of correctional health care. That's in jail, in county jail, in crisis, state, fed, on probation or on parole. That's their health care. I remember not too long ago, everybody was saying, if, I don't want to say Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act got to be 7 million people, we'd be celebrating. No one's celebrating 7.3 million African Americans or people incarcerated on this form of system. It's probably one of the most, effect, most costly and most ineffective systems that you can have. But if you pare down those numbers of 1.1 to 31, you look at African Americans. African American males, one in three, will be incarcerated at some time in their life. One is sex Hispanic, one in 17, yeah, one in 17 whites. So when you start looking at the one in 31, and then you start narrowing those numbers down. You start to understand the impact of this disease, this correctional health care system. If, I don't know any other system that could have a 52% increase in costs and people go, what the heck? They don't say anything about it. But correctional health care, regardless of what you do, of, you know, saying we're not going to incarcerate that many people, we're not going to do that, because they have allowed people to be in the system, in the mandatory systems, people are going to be incarcerated for a long time. People say, oh, it's because you got old inmates. No. The reality is an old inmate is 53 years old. Now, I'm long past 53, so I mean, you know, these people are talking about that's old. People are dying in corrections at a very, very young age, and their bodies are completely worn out. But in 1976, there was this Supreme Court ruling called Estelle versus Gamble. And what it was, it said, you cannot continue treating people with, I'm trying to be polite about it, cruel and unusual punishment. They are guaranteed rights under the Eighth Amendment. So there is a ruling that every inmate is entitled to health care. Now the question is, what does entitled, what does correctional health care mean, and what does standards of care mean? But the reality, there are three rules. I'll send anybody who wants our presentation, so because I know we're on a time frame, but I'll send you the information. So that, oh, I'm sorry, my slides are not yours. The next one is if we're looking at correctional health care epidemic. How in the heck, Donna was talking about the level of, of hep C, and Dr. Howell was talking about that, by the way, correction is not even included in those conversations about the epidemic of correctional health care. The reality is somewhere around 40% of inmates have hep C. It's a massive number of people when you start looking at it. And then when I'm talking to friends of mine in corrections, they say, no, Teresa, you're wrong. The number's much higher. The three leading deaths in corrections right now, all related to hep C. And they're dying 54, 55. It's 10 times greater in the corrections than any other population in the country. 70% of all inmates come in with, with some type of um, drug use. And more women come in enter with hep C than men do. So I want to show you some numbers. When you're talking about correctional health care, always re uh, corrections, always remember, remember it is a public health issue. Because your correctional, your general fund dollars are associated with corrections. So I don't know, I'll send all these slides. So what happens is, it happens is you take the number one in 31. The reality is in Georgia, it's one in 13 adults. 
If you look at Michigan, 22% of all of its, its general fund dollars are associated with corrections. Now, I don't know why they have so many problems, but I mean, that's an enormous amount of money when you look at it. The one that's, and then if you look at the numbers on the side and you look at the percentage of how much, so 22% for Michigan, California, which is where I'm from, 10% of those dollars are voting from corrections. But if you, and then you start looking at the charts on the side, the yellow number. So if you have 139 inmates that have hepatitis C in your state, that is the equivalent of the entire population of Hampton, Virginia. If you start looking at 300 plus thousand, that's Anchorage, Alaska. If you look at 400, you're looking at Sacramento, California. Now think about what that number is of people who need care, that they're gonna end up dying, they're not producing revenue, it's just gonna be a costly mess. So if someone said, should you spend money on these new drugs? That's however you'd like to look at it. I serve on the San Francisco Task Force in San Francisco, and we have a guy who is very proudly saying that he's a $5 million man from Hep C. Make a decision how you want to do it. So what we were able to do is, like I said, we chose to redefine correctional health care as a public health care issue. And surprise, 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 maybe t today at least it seems to be working. Next week it may not be working. A month ago it wasn't working. We got the California Department of Corrections to buy into this crazy program of ours. We didn't do that because we said to them, we think that would be a benefit to the inmates. Because we knew that story was not gonna fly. It's just, that was not who they are. What we said was we could save you some money. And would you like to look like a winner? Somehow that buzzword worked. And so when I'm doing economic analysis and when you're dealing with certain communities, you don't say to them, and I'd like to be able to show you how to be able to help our community. That's my program. That's my eyes on the prize. What do I need to tell them to make this program work is a whole different story. So this is what you do in numbers. So when you're looking at, I was talking to some people from Detroit. They said, we have this problem with hep C in the Michigan prisons. It's like, really? And what ended up happening is we looked at, they had, I think it was, they have eight counties, eight zip codes in Wayne County just eight, where primarily everybody goes back to those, to those zip codes or those neighborhoods from the corrections. That eight populated, those eight zip codes alone constitute 17 plus percent of the entire county. So if you think about the level of hep C, you think 22% of their general fund. Now I think that they could use that general fund on some other things to keep people out of corrections but you have to be able to show them a means in which to do it. The one that blew me away was Wisconsin. So when you look at Wisconsin, their population, again, if you're looking at numbers, one in 39 of their adults are incarcerated. On the surface, you go, dang, this looks dang good. They're spending less than 8% of their general fund on corrections, still within the margins. Then you start paring down. Now, number one, I'm not big on Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, any of those places are too cold. I'm a true native Californian, so, <laughs> I mean, every time I've gone to one of those places, I am like freezing. But what I found is that when you look and you pare down on those numbers, in, in Milwaukee County alone, over half of African American males around age 30 have been incarcerated half of which of African-American men at age 40 have been incarcerated. As an economist, you go, it's damn near impossible. But when you start paring that number down, imagine 42.6 from 1990 to 2012, African-American men in Milwaukee County, 42.6 million days of their lives were lost in corrections if you pare that down one more time, because that number seems sort of staggering, the reality is it's 17,000 years of life is gone in corrections. So you start looking at numbers from that standpoint. And you start saying, well, $3.38 million, billion dollars was spent on corrections. That's $3.38 billion that could have been used on that community. And if you look at their primary years, of parenting, economic years, premature death, 
there's no tax base, there's no revenue generated, and all you see is dollars going out the door. Sort of like one of those bad rap videos where you see people raining the numbers down. <laughs> so, ain't no money coming in. So, it's really, I mean, I saw something like the rap or whatever, and somebody said you had to have $10,000 to start. It's like, please, do something else. So here's what we do. I, I have this group, as I said, called Wings for Life. And what we do is we look at the economics, but we also under have to understand the numbers. And the key to understanding hepatitis C is there's like no surveillance. So we have this brilliant epidemiologist, and we develop demographics, sort of like they have the million dollar blocks that they did on criminality. We develop those on hepatitis C. So we're able to work in a community and define hepatitis C by the level of age, race, gender, okay? And more importantly, neighborhood. Because if you're gonna remove those dollars and look at equity and talk about healthcare disparities, you need to know where you're gonna put those dollars to. And that's what we're able to do. What we found is the looking at hepatitis C in these underserved or community of commitment the age of the people who are having hep C are far younger than people who are the baby boomers. And so you gotta target, tar it sounds like we talked about kids, target, target, focus, focus on those communities because by doing that, you'll make a big difference. So the next one is, we looked at hepatitis C in Chicago and in, and in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is on the right. So what if you, if you look at the numbers from age 15 to 24, 25 to 34, through age 44, that population, although everybody talks about baby boomers, that population is a population you really need to target. But this whole advent of young people using opiates, going into heroin, what we're finding is in Cape Cod, upstate New York, San Francisco, the population and the demographics of young people with hep C is a massive number and you're finding more and more women are doing it. So you have to do educational programs. Somehow you have to teach some young girl that being second on the needle is not some love thing that some joker's doing for you. It just isn't. But you hear these young girls, oh, he loves me so much that he would love me to shoot right after him. That ain't love. So here's our program that we're doing in Department of Corrections. So again, any given day, at any given moment, after we have had these agreements and emails going back and forth, they go, I don't believe you, Teresa, that's not what we agreed. So as I stand here today, this is what we have agreed to, okay? And this is what we're holding their, to the fist, their, fire, their feet to the fire. We have three correctional facilities that we're looking at. And what our goal is, is to raise awareness of hepatitis C. In some states, you have to be damn near dead to get a hep C test. Wait a minute, that's not to get the test, that may be even to request a test. So there's all these policy changes that we need to be able to look at how to be able to change. You need to educate people on hep C, the inmates. You gotta be able to say to them that, you know, it may be really cute that because you're with this gang and you guys are tattooing the heck out of yourself and you're only using your same blood, this is all contaminated blood. So you've got to be able to educate them. You've got to be able to educate the correctional system on the level of hep C, that people don't have to die. And the other one that what we ended up doing is we ended up forming these communities. And so we have a correctional health care um, task force. And what we did was we brought in people from public health departments, people who, these are people who never talk to one another. They got the same people they're dealing with, but nobody ever talks to one another. And so what we did was that we built this whole community outreach leadership with them. And now they talk back and forth. They do all their continuity of care. They're able to make this system work, primarily because they finally stopped, they had to stop and realize you can't do this in a silo. You simply cannot. And by the way, they all know one another. They're dealing with the same people. These people are going back and forth. Everybody knows them back and forth. So it makes more sense. And the other one is you enroll them in the Affordable Care Act. Use the Affordable Care Act as much as you can, and you could do so in corrections. And by the way, when I'm speaking of corrections, you could do so in the county jail. I'm not sure if it's nationwide, but in California, within the first, if an inmate's in 73 hours, 
He, is, he has to be enrolled in the Affordable Care Act. Enroll, enroll, enroll. Because that person, when he comes out, which you know they're gonna cycle through, that whenever he's going for health care, his health care is, is a right, he, he's insured. The other part of it is because they're major institutions, they have to be able to share their medical records. There's this whole electronic record. So corrections like, I ain't doing this, went through this. So then you say to him, well, number one, you, don't, you have no choice. And then there's like, of course I have a choice, I'm corrections, because I'm God. But then the reality is you say, oh, by the way, we can show you how to save some money. We might have another conversation because now for the first time, people who are in the system, as they come out, their medical records could go to, we know where they're going. It's not like they're going to Mount Sinai. You know, you're, they're going to the local public hospital. So you share those medical records with them. Whatever happens to that inmate when he's outside, then those records could come back. The amounts of money that could be saved both for correction and to the public health. Public health has electronic records at this point. These are things that need to be done. And then what we ended up doing is we did this model, our social return on investment model, which is able to help them measure the change. But the key to this is, is in this graph, what we're able to do is that anybody who is tested and they're staying there, we have their age, we have what yard that they're in, we have their race, which is critical, we have their length of sentencing, and we know what community they're going back to. So if you have an inmate who's 30 years old and he has hep C and he has, for like a better word, a prolonged stay with you and he's gonna be there for the next 20 years, you may wanna think about taking care of this guy because otherwise it's gonna cost you a fortune. And what we've done is we developed this management of care so that when someone from county says, well, the moment I test this guy, I gotta treat him. No, you don't. You can manage his care. And so they, it's for them to be able to learn how to do that. So I'm almost done because I know we're running out of time. So here's what my, ask, my question to you is. In 1980s, the early 80s, when HIV came out, we were left out of this conversation. Last time I remember, everything was about white gay men. First two women who died of, hep, of HIV, African American and Hispanic women in the 80s, we were left out. Please, please, please do not be left out of this conversation. We are dying and in silence. People are talking right now about the measles outbreak. What, they got 2,000 people with measles? I'm sorry, I'm not gonna complain about those people who have 2,000 people with measles. I know it's ugly, and apparently people haven't seen it in a long time. But when you have this number of people with the disease, and they're looking like everybody in this room, why aren't we having this conversation? I serve on two of the largest boards of hepatitis in the state of California, and you see me and my lone black behind most of the time at meetings. That's it. And then most of that time, every once in a while, I'm just acting like some ghetto child, but I always have my numbers, because their entire conversation are on white gay men with hep C. Sorry, guys, not that damn interested. That's not who I am. I didn't get on the board to have this conversation. And it's really this challenging conversation of, we're not gonna be talking about that. You're not gonna use black folks saying, well, we see the charts with the African-Americans, Hispanics, we know them, and then you're not even gonna talk about us. You're gonna use us, but you're not gonna have us involved in these conversations. Stay in the conversation, stay focused. I know it sounds like my kid is football. Focus, focus, focus. Get on boards, demand answers, and be a part of this conversation. We are dying, we are dying too young. So the other one is that we got, because of the communities that we worked in, I'm getting off, we, I'm off, I'm off. I'll talk to anybody who would like to later. Don is gonna kick me off the stage. So I'm done, thank you very much. Oh, this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Know that I, I started my career as a federal prosecutor, so I do have a bit of a reputation. Um, we do have a moment. Uh, we can take at least one question if you have it. We had a lot of information here, and the speakers will be available um, as we change over to the next uh, session. So if there is a question, please approach the microphone. I see Delegate Nathan Pulliam, so I'll let you have that. Have our single question here for the session. Yes. Um, good morning. 
Good morning. And Dr. Howard and Ms. Hughes, um, I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation only because it sounds like the stuff that I've been talking about in Maryland. This past legislative session, I put forth legislation on the Hep C for those for the high risk and for those who were born between 1945 and 1965. I had almost 30 different sponsors, I mean supporters of, my, of the legislation, including the National Medical Association and numerous hepatitis C and HIV AIDS group from around the country had sent letters in. My bill was modeled after the New York legislation. I tried to get Dr. Howell has come and testified on many of my hep C bills. But what, what was disgusting to me was that after we fought so hard on this piece of legislation, they wouldn't let it out of committee because the MedCI, which is the, the, the medical group in Maryland mm -hmm. and the Hospital Association and FQAC decided they didn't want the bill. They didn't want anybody to tell them what to do in terms of a one-time testing. So this is why, because New York had the same problem, but what happened is that New York did manage to work it out with the doctors and with, um, with the hospital association. So that is my fight. And so the fight continues. I know what I'm doing is when I'm on the radio or talking, I tell people when you're going to see your doctor now, you ask them for that one-time testing if you're born within those period of time when they were not yet testing, peop testing the blood to see if people had blood transfusion before 1987. There were still those, kind of, those people that may, may have gotten the virus. Or, and when we talk about correctional health, I passed legislation in Maryland to pa do education and testing several years ago. I think you testified on that one too, Dr. Howell. And so what happened is that I get 3,000 men or more in this Maryland um, correctional system that has hepatitis C. But when I get the printout, you may have only 110 of them that is getting any form of treatment. So I, I hear what you're saying. I'm frustrated about it myself, but we'll continue to fight on this issue. And I'm asking if there's any way that I can possibly get some of your slides and your information as I'm speaking around the country. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you so very much for your work. Thank you for yours. So as I bring this session to a close, I just want to thank our speakers and to uh, reemphasize the point that the, the power of life and death lies in our tongues. And that's never been truer than in this case. Um, it also lies in our ability to create accountability to all of these actions and programs that are now starting the action plans that we'll hear more about when Dr. Ko, when uh, Assistant Secretary Ko speaks later this afternoon. Um, it's a time for accountability. It's a time for all of us to make sure that everyone has access, that no one goes um, undiagnosed, that no one goes untreated, that no one goes um, unlooked after. So thank you. Thanks,